English naturalist Charles Darwin published his work on evolution and the struggle for survival in 1859. In the struggle for survival, the fittest win out at the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to their environment. Indeed, one can argue that the basic beliefs of liberalism were instilled with the concept of survival of the fittest. Those with greater intelligence, willpower, and industriousness succeeded while those without those qualities failed. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, which is much more complex than the simplistic formulas that people normally associate it with, but such things as survival of the fittest, uh, were immediately applied not by Darwin, but by others, in what we call social Darwinism. Social Darwinism, an intellectual trend that further justified the widening gap between rich and poor, the racial superiority inherent in European imperialism, and ultimately, war. European settlers in North America turned to African slaves as a cheaper, more plentiful labor source than indentured servants. After 1619, when a Dutch ship brought 20 Africans ashore at the British colony of Jamestown, Virginia, slavery spread throughout the American colonies. Under the system that became chattel slavery, a racial element was critical. Slaves were blacks of African descent and owned by whites. A lot of people, black and white alike, don't understand the many, many, many ways um, that this country is still impacted by the legacy of slavery um, and the fact that although you can't hold people's physical bodies in bondage any longer, um, ideas about race, meanings of race, what it means to be black in this country, uh, those ideas haven't really been fully discussed and they certainly haven't been resolved yet. I think what made American slavery unique is the way it tore families apart and um, just did harm to the culture, to the humanity of, um, of African Americans who were forcibly brought here. Racism exists when one ethnic group or historical collectivity dominates, excludes, or seeks to eliminate another on the basis of differences that it believes are hereditary and unalterable. Superior individuals will be more likely to survive and pass on these traits to their offspring so such traits will increase in number while the weaker individuals will eventually die off. These differences gradually produce new groups, some of which have an advantage in terms of survival. These new groups become the superior or more evolved races or one race above all. My definition of racism is the belief that a particular group of people is somehow inferior to a mainstream group of people, whether it's based on, uh, well, mostly because it's based on their race and, and, the, and the particular uh, ideas they have about that race, about, what, about the way that people behave, about the way, about the things that people do. But overall, the general idea that for whatever sociological, scientific, biological reason, uh, this group of people is inferior to another group of people. Sociologically, race is uh, a social construct of, of the United States. Uh, historically, uh, race was uh, constructed to um, highlight the difference between uh, whites or Caucasians or Europeans and, um, and the African slaves. Racism exists because people want it, like it, nurture it, and teach their young it. It's part of a self-defense and I am better than you mechanism for uh, satisfaction and advancement. Women were often violated by their slave owners and overseers. Because slaves were considered as property, the property owner could do what he wanted. If someone rapes someone else's slave, um, the violation is not that you rape this woman, the violation is that you mess with someone else's property. Girls ages 14 and 15 were sold more than boys. The main reason was for reproductive purposes. 
rapes often resulted in biracial children. There have always been interracial relationships. Um, interracial, it, it, may not, it may have been frowned upon. Interracial marriages were certainly, you know, uh, illegal at a certain point. Uh, but these relationships did occur, and so as a result, you do have these biracial children. My, my father is black, my mom is white, and it, it didn't mean anything to me growing up. Um, I've got three other siblings, um, older sister, older brother, and a younger brother, and we were a tight-knit family. They kept us at home a lot, and we didn't have a problem with that. We just loved being around each other, and so honestly, um, just spending time with my siblings, like we looked the same, and I went to school and I just didn't think anything different about the kids that I was with. We grew up in Manhattan, Kansas, which now that I look at it and can think about it, um, it was a predominantly white town. And I think I realized that when we moved to Wichita, Kansas. And we moved there right before my eighth grade year. And the school that I got thrown into was predominantly Hispanic and black. And so I did start hanging out with um, more black kids and uh, there were certain tendencies that I had that changed. I was acting more like them, I was talking more like them. And then I transferred to Wichita Collegiate School. It was a private school, it was all white. Um, and I really think that going back to Wichita Collegiate in a white, it sounds bad, but a white environment, it was um, better for me to develop myself. I don't know how much it means in the 21st century. Um, I do know that in the late 19th and into, a tw into the 20th century, uh, many African Americans chose to pass because it was the only way they could have any sort of opportunities. Is your mother a nigger? Tell me. Tell me! What difference does it make? It was the only way that they could, you know, realize their full life potential because they understood that if they identified as African American, certain avenues or most avenues in this country at that point you know, we're closed off to them. You can't work where you want to work. You can't live where you want to live. And so many of them made what was, I would imagine, the very difficult decision uh, to try to merge into the mainstream. And it is a difficult decision in many instances because what does that mean? It means that maybe you don't ever have children because you never know what the children are going to come out looking like. I can never pass for white. Um, you don't look at me and see a white person. So I would identify myself more with, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of, I guess I would have to identify myself more with black people, but at the same time, I'm comfortable um, who I am. I'm comfortable hanging around with my white friends or hanging around with black friends too, so. I haven't had too many huge struggles or anything like that. I don't, I haven't been through anything awful, so I mean, I'm biracial and that's what it is. Racial domination can be defined in two manifestations, institutional racism and interpersonal racism. Institutional racism is a systemic white domination of people of color, embedded and operating in corporations, universities, legal systems, political bodies, cultural life, and other social collectives. Adolf Hitler was an Austrian-born German politician and leader of the Nazi party. In the 1933 Nuremberg Party rally, Hitler proclaimed that higher race subjects itself to a lower race a right which we see in nature and which can be regarded as the sole conceivable right. Terms such as superior race, lower human types, pollution of the race were often used by Hitler and other Nazi leaders. I think race is important to everybody. People tend to think in terms of race for themselves and their history and their culture I'm not, I don't believe because there are different colors or different cultures that necessarily they need to be discriminated towards each other, but I think race is important to each individual. I think that each uh, person, uh, race, class, religious, um, ethnic, cultural, um, has what's called an ethnocentric perspective, which means that they believe that their particular group is best. I think from an economical standpoint, people who have accumulated more or have more probably feel 
some discrimination to those who haven't. And I think on the other side of that is people who haven't accumulated as much or is not making as much probably feel somewhat that way towards people who have. It was Spencer who coined the term survival of the fittest, using it to apply to the fate of rich and poor in a laissez-faire capitalist society. Spencer argued that there was nothing unnatural and therefore wrong with competing and then rising to the top of the cutthroat capitalist world or perhaps survival of the riches. From the beginnings, I think, until all through American history, I think that uh, economics uh, underpins, reinforces, and is related to many of the tensions um, on, on, on the gradient of race in America. The tensions largely came out of real or perceived economic rivalries amongst uh, workers in the United States or potential uh, 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 labor force rivalries between white workers and African American workers. They came about at different stages in American history because um, groups and uh, elites and groups that had preponderance of power needed and wanted to have people uh, that they could keep in subordinate positions. And in Southern history, there's a wonderful, uh, almost a children's rhyme that was told outside of the stores in the post-Civil War period. And it went this way, a naught's a naught, that is to say a no is a no, a figure is a figure, a number is a number, everything for the white man, nothing for the nigger. So yes, economics has had something to do with it. It's had to do with who's hired, who's fired, who's promoted, where factories established, what labor is employed, who you vote for, and who's the president of the United States today. When it comes to economic status, is race even considered a factor anymore? We are mo moving towards a society where people are being given opportunities or relinquishing opportunities because of the skills or processes that they do or don't know how to do and how also they can conduct themselves in whatever environment in which they're placed. Yes, because it's like racism, it really can't be stopped. I think it was still, you know, racism will still be there, but no, because I have, like, I go to ASU. It's why people here too, we have the same education. It's like, it depends on if you take the extra step to do something, to work, to work hard at it. I believe that it's equal opportunity. I think it's equal. I mean, honestly, I think that the society has grown so much. I mean, my best friend is black and she's, she's kind of like in the same major as I am, so we're both kind of working together. And we both have the equal opportunity. We both, I mean, we're really like the same person, just different colors, really, our personalities, everything. And we both are treated the exact same. If I were white, um, yes, honestly, I do believe things would be different. Um, I just don't think I would have that drive or that motivation to push forward. I use my race as an, uh, as an advantage in my endeavors because, because I have to, I've had to earn everything I've gotten in life. I've had help along the way, but I've earned everything. I wasn't giving handouts, so I wasn't inheriting any money. And I've been, I've, I've, I've had um, success and I had failures. I think that sometimes it might play a role in how successful you get, just because some people are still racist and I believe that there are people out there that are like that. And so I think that sometimes, you know, that might come into play with like getting a job or something, um, just because some people haven't gotten over that barrier. But I mean, I would say that the majority of people in the United States have, you just don't, sometimes you just don't see it happening. The challenge for the population is to carefully avoid all the social pitfalls and through diligence and determination, break through the barriers and attain the requirements for admittance into the elite class. Examples of this can be seen in successful professional athletes, musicians, entrepreneurs, and politicians. Barack Obama. Justin Bieber. Samantha Steele. Oprah. Perfect class in comparison to Darwin's theory are the new fittest, 
and those who attain that feat creates more opportunities for people of their kind. Modern day American society is more tolerant to people outside the dominant white race. Eventually, I mean, I see us moving toward that, you know, but right now, I don't feel as though that we're there. We still probably have a couple of more centuries to go, honestly. As a country, the USA is moving towards um, a time when we not only champion all the races that we find within our country and all the ethnic groups as well, but we use that to our advantage. There's always going to be those people that are racist. I just think that there's so many different kinds of people in America, it's, it's going to be there. Because everything's, especially in the field I am in communications, everything's about either, either race or subgroups of race, fair-skinned, dark-skinned, light-skinned versus the dark-skinned. It's, 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 it's almost in our DNA now. I definitely think it is. I mean, with the second term of Obama um, going ahead and starting, I think that it's just going to continue to diminish in our society. I think race will always be here. Um, the Bible speaks about poverty, and it says the poor will always be among you. Um, it's not a bad thing for there to be race. I think it's a bad thing when those racial differences are made into an us and them. Race stops to be as significant for people in the elite class as it would be for those who fail to make it in. When an individual of any color makes it into the elite class, race dies.